Hey everyone, this week we're going to talk a little bit about the prairie burn that we were able to do, as you can see behind me, uh, just a couple weeks ago. And Adam is going to tell us a little bit about a coffee alternative that uh, he decided to make this week. Looks like it's time to refill my coffee. Hmm. Oh man, are we out of coffee? Well, how am I supposed to get any work done now? <sighs> Looks like I have to think of something else. So we ran out of coffee back at the office, which is a bit unfortunate because, like a lot of Americans, I can't really seem to get a lot done in the morning without several cups. But instead of going all the way to the store, I figured I'd just take a little walk and look for one of these trees right here. So this is a Kentucky coffee tree, Latin name Gymnocletus dioecus. And as the common name suggests, you can use the seeds of this tree to produce a coffee-like beverage. And this was done by several indigenous American cultures in our region, and also by colonial southerners during times of poverty or war, when real coffee was too hard to come by or too expensive for most households. Uh, they would use this brew as a substitute or to add to what little coffee they could get to make it last longer, similar to chicory. So today we're gonna give it a shot. So before we get to the coffee making, let's take a closer look at this thing because it is one of my favorite native trees. As you can see, it has this kind of gray scaly bark with these fissures in it and this kind of reddish brown color underneath. Pretty rough surface texture, so as you can see, that makes it a very popular hangout spot for various mosses and lichens. These are alternately branched with these kind of knobby looking twigs. And if you look at the buds, 
you can see they're very small and kind of pushed into these little cavities. So they don't really stick out like other tree buds do. And if you feel them, they have this downy covering on top. So they're like fuzzy little buttons. The leaves fall off pretty early in the fall. So of course this tree is bare right now. But they are unique in that they are one of the few bipinnately compound leaves in Missouri. If you think of a walnut leaf, which is this regular compound, has a petiole with several leaflets. It's kind of like that, only each leaflet is its own compound leaf. This really nice looking foliage. And these trees are dioecious, which means there are separate male and female plants. This one happens to be a female. So if we look around, there might be some fruits on the ground here we can find. Ah, bingo! There we go. So as you might be able to tell, this is in the legume family, the Fabaceae. It has these thick, leathery seed pods that look like beans. And they contain several seeds inside that we are going to use to make our coffee. So I'm going to see how many of these I can find and see if we can uh, brew up some Kentucky coffee. So I managed to get a pretty good amount of pods off the coffee trees at work. And inside each one of these is a small handful of these smooth brown seeds surrounded by this sticky green goo that you probably don't want to eat. So I'm going to crack all these open, get as many of these seeds out of here as I can, clean off all the gunk, and proceed to roasting. So I got a pretty good handful of seeds out of those pots. Now I have my cleaned seeds in this old pot. So I'm going to cover them up. I have my oven heated to 300 degrees. So I'm going to stick them in and roast them for about three hours. And we'll see how they turn out. So our beans just got out of the oven. As you can see, some of them kind of exploded a little bit. So good thing I had that lid on. It doesn't really smell like roasted coffee beans. It's more like a burnt toast. A little bit, so <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to let these cool down a little bit and then grind them up. Here it is post grinding. Uh, looks looks like coffee. Got a nice uh, fine texture to it. Looks pretty good. So I just finished grinding up the last of my seeds and now I have just under a cup of fresh Kentucky coffee. It's, it's all natural, it's organic, it's uh, free range, uh, locally produced, uh, other such buzzwords. But it's actually pretty good looking and and it smells like coffee. You know, maybe like a cheaper brand coffee, but it's it's pretty good. With like there's little little hints of cocoa in there maybe and uh you know, a little little bit of a dirt smell, kind of an earthy earthy scent, but overall pretty good. So, yeah, this should be enough to brew a few cups to experiment with a little bit and uh yeah i'm i'm optimistic at this point just got a couple tablespoons of uh, our coffee ground in the old french press gonna get my water kettle add some water to it Ooh, 
yeah, look at that. Look how dark that is. Okay, so we're all done with our French press here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, plunge it and pour it. Oh man, just went right through that like water. Oh boy. All right, here we go. Cheers. Okay, so it's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. It, it's not nearly as bad as people were telling me it was going to be. It kind of reminds me of like cheap, watery diner coffee. Like, like the very last cup of coffee that's left in the pot and it's been sitting there a while. It's got that little layer of sludge on the bottom and it tastes a little bit burnt, uh, but it's okay. A little cream, maybe a little sugar, couldn't hurt, but it's it's okay. And, and it does still have that kind of earthy, cocoa-y undertone to it, so not bad. Worth a try anyway. It really wasn't that bad, but James made me do that. Smells like black coffee. It's actually not that bad. Tastes like black coffee. Still good. Not a bad way to start the day. So why do we burn prairies? It's such important habitat for so much wildlife, for pollinators, to birds, to small mammals and amphibians, reptiles, so many. And it's not just the food, it's also the cover, like for these wild turkeys raising their young. It's a place where animals can hide from other predators, and it's a place where predators can hide and find their prey. So when we're burning prairies, it is just replicating a natural event of the ecosystem that would occur periodically anyways. So this would happen quite frequently in these dormant periods of the prairie, where everything's nice and dry. 
And so when we purposefully set these prescribed burns on the prairie, or in woodlands, they are helping keep woody plants at bay from slowly taking over and converting a prairie into woodland, or helping remove invasive species, to removing plant material that is built up over a long period of time so that new plants can germinate from seed. So it's very vital that we perform this service that, like I said, would occur naturally. And this year we got to burn uh, the North Prairie. Uh, it didn't go quite as planned. The wind did shift on us, uh, making the fire uh, move a bit quicker than we had anticipated. But we were able to get out ahead of it and uh, do it safely and protect the surrounding areas uh, from catching fire. So we were able to maintain and control the burn within the prescribed burn unit. Staff did a great job of following directions and getting it done, keeping us all safe and protecting the surrounding property. Everybody did so good with their training. And we were able to wrap up the last little bit of unburnt prairie with a little bit of head fire right at the end which created a nice smoke column going up into the sky once the prairie was extinguished we were able to check all the lines and start a fire in the north woods, a small strip of woodland on the edge of the North Prairie that we've been doing a lot of restoration work in. And a lot of the areas where we've gotten a lot of grasses and other native plants to grow in actually burned quite well, as you can see in these videos. And we couldn't have gotten this all done uh, without some help from our friends at the main garden, from the Center for Conservation and Sustainable Development helping out, as well as some of our coworkers from the Education Division. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to pull off this burn. So I'm very grateful to their assistance. And as you can see, we've got quite a bit of burnt area, which is great. And it's removed a lot of invasive plants uh, growing in those areas like winter creeper. So thanks to all, we had a very successful burn in uh, 2020. In post prairie burn, we get to see some interesting things. Uh, we get to see the actual lay of the land and since I've only been here at Litzinger uh, a little over two years now, I've not been able to participate in a burn of the North Prairie before. And so now I get to see what the actual topography looks like once the prairie is burnt. So sometimes it's hard to show topography on video when it's subtle changes, but hopefully you can see right here in front of me this little bit of a dip. And we're currently standing in a little swale looking back up and if you see these large unburned woody plants those are indigo bushes now indigo bushes uh, typically like it a little bit wetter and here you can really see it uh, quite well that they are only growing within the swale Here you can see one of the woody plants we hope to set back 
that's a bit aggressive in our prairies, and that's our native blackberry. Um, and burning in the fall can help with setting this back and giving advantage to other prairie plants. And you may ask, well, why did we leave so much stubble unburned? So many people uh, love to get their grasslands burned completely down to the soil. Well, leaving stubble like this uh, is the same reason why we do not burn all of our prairies at once, and that is to leave refuge for wildlife so they have places to hide and overwinter. You also get to see things like ant mounds, and you can see there a hole where something else might be hibernating in, to cool things like this, uh, a deer that had died in the prairie in 2019, and the burn uncovered its bones. as well as a turkey egg from earlier this spring. You also get to see uncovered insect galls on stems of plants. But if that means if I can see them, that means birds can see them too. And then they come in and eat those insects. And the prairies are just full of birds taking advantage of all the uncovered insects and other wildlife that they get to eat.